and welcome. The chances are good that if you've ever perused the cheap comic bins at stores or at conventions, you've probably run across some of these Atlas titles, and then you flipped right past them and gave them no thought. For the most part, well, you aren't missing much. The content is interesting to varying degrees, but what's more interesting is the story behind Atlas Comics and the slight but noticeable effect it had on the comic book industry. First of all, there's an influential figure in comic book history that has to be mentioned. That person is publisher Martin Goodman. If the legend is to be believed, when Goodman was informed that DC was having great success with its Justice League comic book, he told Stan Lee to come up with a superhero comic to tap into DC's sales success. This led Stan Lee to sit down with Jack Kirby and create the Fantastic Four in 1961. Of course, this comic book established the empire known as Marvel Comics. Basically, throughout the 60s, as Marvel Comics became the dominant force in the superhero genre, Martin Goodman was the man Stan Lee answered to. Mind you, Stan was writing and producing hits in his sleep, so Goodman probably didn't interfere too much in the daily business of Marvel Comics. In 1968, Goodman sold Marvel Comics to Cadence Industries, but he remained the publisher of Marvel Comics until he decided to retire in 1972. One of the prior conditions he set for the sale of Marvel Comics was that his son, Charles Goodman, would become the publisher once he stepped down. However, when Martin Goodman announced his retirement, Stan Lee lobbied hard for the publisher position. The new owners decided that Stan had a proven track record and was, quite honestly, deserving of the publisher position, whereas Charles Goodman was a mostly unknown and unproven quantity. This decision to install Stan Lee as the publisher of Marvel Comics seems to be the chief inspiration for Martin Goodman to establish Atlas Comics in 1974. By all appearances, Martin Goodman wanted to prove that the success of Marvel Comics was within his ability and power to replicate, and to also prove that without his input and direction, Stan Lee wouldn't have accomplished all that he did during the 60s. Objectively speaking, there is some truth to that, but only in the sense that Goodman didn't interfere with the creative direction of Marvel Comics during this period. Beyond that, all the credit does belong to the creative talent that produced the actual content that Goodman published. The name Atlas Comics also reinforces the idea that this was a moderately spiteful publishing venture. After all, Atlas Comics was the name of the comic book company that would be renamed Marvel Comics in 1961. Also, the house ads for Atlas Comics proclaimed they were the new house of ideas, which was a blatant jab at Marvel Comics. Finally, Goodman hired Larry Lieber, Stan Lee's brother, to be an editor on the Atlas Comics line of magazines. So, in 1974, with millions at his disposal, Martin Goodman started Atlas Comics, and he set out to challenge Marvel Comics' market share. In order to attract the necessary talent, Goodman offered a load of incentives that hadn't been seen in the industry at that point. For one, the artists were given their original artwork back. This was a practice that wouldn't become an industry standard for another decade. For another, page rates were generous, much higher than those offered by either Marvel or DC. And finally, creators owned the rights to their creations. Again, this was something neither Marvel or DC would offer to the talent. These incentives did attract some new upcoming talent, such as Walter Simonson, Howard Chaikin, Pat Broderick, Larry Hama, and Michael Fleischer. But most veterans of the field, with the exception of Steve Ditko, Wally Wood, and Mike Sikowski, stayed where they were and weren't tempted to switch their allegiance to a new company. With Martin Goodman's fortune, contacts, and reputation, coupled with the incentives being offered to the creative talent, Atlas Comics should have been a noticeable force in the comic book industry. However, within a year, after the publication of an aggressive variety of comic books and magazines, Atlas Comics would suddenly shut down and become a footnote in comic book history. So, what happened? How did a company that had a lot of potential and so much to offer the creative talent fail so thoroughly? Essentially, it was a perfect storm of bad decisions. The appointed publisher, Charles Goodman, the son of Martin Goodman, was by all accounts incompetent and had no perceptible interest in comic books. Also, the corporate mandate seemed to focus on plundering the talent pool of Marvel Comics and producing material that directly challenged Marvel's market share more than anything else. This was evidenced very early on. Within a few months, before any sales data was available to indicate what was and wasn't successful, the direction of many of the Atlas titles dramatically changed. Creative teams were replaced. Characters suddenly became completely different. It appeared to be a very capricious decision, but all of this was an effort to be more Marvel than Marvel Comics. 
Possibly one of the most dramatic examples of this is The Scorpion. The first two issues were written and drawn by Howard Chaikin, and the series was one of the best being produced for Atlas at the time. The title itself and the lead character was the basic prototype of the type of material Chaikin has produced throughout his career. However, when the third issue landed, Chaikin was replaced, and the character became a standard superhero with a costume and a secret identity. It was, in essence, a hard reboot that bore no resemblance to the two issues that preceded it, other than the name. Atlas Comics also chased trends, which was a strategy Martin Goodman had used during the 50s, and some of its comics tried to copy the success of other titles. For example, the comic book Planet of Vampires was a slight ripoff of the recent movie Omega Man. After a failed negotiation to acquire the license to that movie, it was decided to create a property loosely based on the concept, resulting in that title. Iron Jaw was an obvious copy of Conan. The Brute was a direct copy of The Incredible Hulk. Hands of the Dragon chased the Kung Fu trend. Morlock 2001 greatly resembled Swamp Thing. So, being original wasn't necessarily on the Atlas Comics agenda. The two editors in charge of the entire Atlas Comics output, Larry Lieber and Jeff Rovin, were mismatched for the material they oversaw. Lieber, who was more familiar with superhero material, was put in charge of the mature black and white magazines. While Rovin, who had worked at Warren, a successful black and white magazine publishing company, was put in charge of the color superhero content. Furthermore, both were subjected to the seemingly capricious whims of the publisher, Charles Goodman. By all accounts, Charles didn't know what he was doing. In essence, he was unprepared for the challenge of establishing a successful comic book company. Within months, many artists and writers got frustrated and bailed on Atlas Comics. Shortly thereafter, the company crashed and burned. While the vast majority of artists and writers at Marvel and DC were freelance, thus capable of taking work anywhere they could find it, there was an unspoken understanding that the talent would be loyal to one company or the other. If you were a freelancer that played the field, so to speak, you would likely find you weren't getting as many assignments from either company as opposed to those that showed loyalty to one company or the other. This understanding, which was practically a company policy, is likely the reason why Atlas was never able to attract creators away from Marvel and DC. Despite the higher page rate, the return of the artwork, and the creator's rights, not to mention the wealth and reputation of Martin Goodman, Atlas Comics was a risk that most wouldn't accept. Marvel and DC were firmly established and offered steady work, if you were loyal. And it may have been suggested that anyone who went to work for Martin Goodman might have a hard time getting further work in the industry should Atlas fail. This point is difficult to confirm, but all things considered, it doesn't seem like unreasonable speculation. As mentioned at the beginning, Atlas Comics did have a slight effect on the industry, despite being a blip in comic book history. In response to Atlas's higher page rate, DC upped their page rate, and, in turn, Marvel was forced to do the same. Also, returning artwork and sharing character rights became a part of the conversation in the comic book industry. Certainly, this was already being discussed, but the fact that a company had actually offered this to its talent helped to give the topic more weight. Still, it would be years before either Marvel or DC would adopt either of these practices, and that would be mainly due to the very public battle of Superman's creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, to get fair compensation for their creation. Bizarrely, Atlas Comics was revived in 2011 by Martin Goodman's grandson, Jason Goodman. The company began publishing the adventures of Grim Ghost and the Phoenix and a crossover title called Atlas Unified. Unfortunately, the trademark for the name Atlas Comics had been acquired by someone else prior to this 2011 revival and, again, Atlas Comics went out of business after a very brief series of publications. Currently, Dynamite Entertainment appears to hold the trademark to Atlas, but there are no signs they'll do anything with that name. That may change in the future. Who knows? So a comic company that is a footnote in comic book history comes with its own footnote. That's a form of irony, I suppose. If I could have another moment of your time, I would like to ask that if you enjoyed this or any other Overlord Comics content, that you support this channel by subscribing. This ensures you're notified of additional content as it's made available. Liking, commenting, and sharing is also a very fine way to show your support. Thank you for your time, and I will talk at you in the near future. Until next time.